the most vulnerable to employ infection prevention and control mechanisms. Executive Director of the Jamaica Cultural Development Commission, JCDC, Lenford Salmon, says personal responsibility will play a major role in controlling the spread of the virus during the celebratory events. We're asking people to exercise due care um, in how they conduct themselves in coming to the city. Walk with your sanitizers, keep sanitizing your hands. If you don't have to, have to go into a very close space with people who are not in your own little bubble, bubble, you know, People forget the word bubble now because we think we are, we are out of it. But the, but the bubble still exists. If you come with family members and things, stick to that bubble and just take all the precautions you can. JCDC's executive director was addressing a recent JIS think tank. He adds that individuals who are sick should stay at home, while those attending the events are advised to wear a mask and practice proper hand and respiratory hygiene. A range of activities are being held island-wide to mark Jamaica's 61st year of independence under the theme, Jamaica 61, Proud and Strong. Mr. Salmon points out that while everybody can't be accommodated in all the physical spaces, they can still enjoy the festivities virtually, with live coverage planned for the two national television stations and on the social media pages of the JCDC and the Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport. And that's it for GIS News Today. I'm Theodore Henry. Thanks for watching. Prime Minister Andrew Holness hands over 10 social houses, implements stronger oversight of the South Coast Highway Improvement Project, and strengthens a partnership agreement for opportunities in the blue economy. You're watching Jamaica House Weekly. I'm Marjorie Gordon. Oversight of the South Coast Highway Improvement Project ship has been strengthened to ensure its timely completion. Last week, Prime Minister Holness assigned direct management and daily supervision to E.G. Hunter, CEO of the National Works Agency. Mr. Hunter will ensure that the contractor, China Harbor Engineering Company, meets the designated targets. The Prime Minister is also getting more directly involved in the project. I met with the Ambassador of China, where we discussed other infrastructural issues, and I raised with them the need for this project to be completed as quickly as possible. So I am expecting that there will be greater speed and alacrity in the completion of the project. But I still urge our Jamaican citizens, particularly those who live and traverse the area of St. Thomas and Portland, to bear in mind the great complexity of the project that is being undertaken. And the fact is that there is no alternate route that could be used. The South Coast Highway Improvement Project represents the largest integrated infrastructure program to be undertaken in Jamaica. The multi-billion dollar project is being executed in three parts. Part A is 28 kilometers from Maypen to Williamsfield, while Part B, subsection 2, involves 17.4 kilometers from Harbour View to Yalas Bridge. The third phase, Part B, subsections 3 and 4, will have work done on 123.65 kilometers of road from the Yalas Bridge to Port Antonio and Morant Bay to Cedar Valley. Still on construction, Mr. Holness has welcomed the social intervention program by Caribbean Cement Company to pave pathways in inner city communities using concrete technology. Newly paved concrete roads in McDonald Place in Olympic Garden, St. Andrew, were officially opened last week. The rehabilitation also involves the rechanneling of rainwater to improve the living condition of residents. When it rained, there was no direction of the water. So it is highly likely that in a heavy shower of rain, homes would be flooded and persons would find it very inconvenient for the living condition of residents to use these muddy pathways. Now, with the paving of this area and the channeling of the water, with a heavy shower of rain, 
it is quite likely now that within minutes these pathways would be usable in great comfort. Mr. Holness says with the use of cement being widely embraced in road construction, the government is looking to expand the usage. Certainly, you will notice if you travel on our highways, we have now made it almost a mandatory feature that we put in what is called road dividers or jersey barriers. The jersey Good morning and welcome to a special edition of our post-cabinet press briefing. In our midst, we have the Minister of Education and Youth, the Honorable Flavor Williams, and Minister Without Portfolio here in the office of the Prime Minister, Dana Morris Dixon. We also have the head of the Heart Trust, NSTA, Dr. Tanya Ingleton. I've got Tanisha Ingleton. Have I got it right the second time? Thank you very much. And I'd also like to welcome um, members of staff from the various ministries, also um, our support from the Jamaica Information Service, and especially you, members of the public, who are joining us. Today we have the launch of the LIFT program, a very important program that was announced by the Prime Minister in March, which will see the engagement of 500 young people over a five-year period, that is 2,500 young people over a five-year period. A very important um, program, but I will not steal the shine of the ministers and the head of Heart Trust here, um, and I would like to invite both ministers to attend upon the podium and make their presentation. Both. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Morning. All right, and it's really good to see everybody here today, and of course, to the members of the media. It's always good to see you. Um, and this is a really important program that I'll be talking about this morning, and it's so much of an honor to have the Minister of Education here too. It does signal a lot about joined up government, which is real, and which is, of course, a priority for us. Now this learning and investment for transformation program, the LIFT program, was announced by the Prime Minister, the Most Honorable Andrew Holness, in his budget presentation. And he noted that this was an important element of the transformation of skills, the transformation of employment in our country. Now last week, you'll remember at the press briefing, at his quarterly press briefing, he did note that you know, even though we've seen rapid recovery from the COVID pandemic, that there were lingering issues. And these lingering issues aren't just issues we see in Jamaica. These are issues that are of a global nature. So it's not just unique to us, it is Jamaica plus the world. And so as a part of this recognition that there are lingering issues, the administration is prioritizing poverty alleviation. Now we saw in a lot of the data around the world that poverty increased during COVID and that is very easy to understand. When you have a pandemic like what we experienced, there would have been displacement in terms of employment, there would have been displacement in terms of just people's ability to earn. And so as a result of that, we would have expected globally that there would have been an impact on poverty. And so as a part of the efforts to kind of, you know, work through those issues that would have been brought on by COVID, we have seen and we're and you've heard in many instances, many new programs that are aimed at addressing some of that fallout. And today we're looking at LIFT, which is really one of those, because when we talk about poverty alleviation, there are many elements to it. And a key element of it is employment. How do we get employment to especially our youth? 
And that is, as you're going to see and you're going to hear from the MD of Heart, who's going to go in more detail, this program is addressing some of that. So when you see the LIFT program, you have to see it within the broader context of um, the administration trying to work through programs that deal with poverty alleviation. And we think, very importantly, that employment, especially at the youth level, and skills training are central to that. And so this initiative is definitely a part of that. Now, this program is not just a ticket to employment, and you're gonna hear a lot about it. We truly believe that it's an investment in our country. It's a very comprehensive initiative, and when you hear the details, you're gonna say, yes, this is really good. Um, it includes job placement, professionalism training, that is very important. I have so many, especially small business people, who tell me that you know, when they employ young people, a lot of times they don't understand how to operate in a work context. They don't understand simple things like the value of coming to work on time. The interpersonal skills with your colleagues are missing in many instances. And so this program will be addressing some of that. It's really about how we professionalize our young people so that when they go into the work world, they can thrive in that work world. So that is an important element of it. And of course, for us, we believe that it is important that we have partnerships. And this program is going to be interesting in that we have global partners who are partnering with us in terms of some of the training, the CV writing that we want to do on some of the other elements. It's really a beautiful program. And so those who come into this program will be given the fundamentals to prosper and to function in this new prosperous Jamaica. And we're going to be targeting school leavers with a specific emphasis on those who finish the pathway program, but it's really for school leavers generally, but we do have that focus. And it's for them to be able to get employment after leaving school. Not everybody goes to tertiary. Um, institutions, not everybody goes to heart, although I would love more to do so, especially since it's free. Um, and I have to keep plugging that heart is free. The Prime Minister announced that and it has been effected. And so that is something that is really, really wonderful. And so we're targeting 500 school leavers each year. And a key element of this is about access and inclusion. We know that sometimes when you have initiatives like these, you know, it may seem as if it's the urban students who benefit. But the administration is very much committed to everyone having access. And so what we've done is to have the nominees come from every constituency, which means we won't leave anybody behind. And that's really critical because the administration is very much committed to this notion that no child, no young person is going to be left behind. And so when you have a quota from every single constituency, it means that every single child can be reached. And that is absolutely critical as a part of this. And so what, is the, what are the goals? We want to bolster the social mobility of 500 school leavers over five years, so 500 each year, so that's gonna be 2,500. And provide them with a sustainable avenue for education and employment and assimilation in society. And we also want them to become productive members and productive citizens in Jamaica. And that's critical, and that's why all of that professionalism training is really central. Not everybody had parents or came from a community that was working with them in these areas. And so it's important that we provide avenues so that these young people who may not have had that may not have experienced anyone saying, you know, this is how you operate in a work environment. This is what you wear. This is how you treat with interpersonal issues at work. They, they never experienced it. And that's what this program is going to be doing in the beginning and also giving them some of the tools to truly be citizens in our country. So at the core of this program is social and economic mobility. That's at the core, that's what we want. We want our students to leave this program feeling that they've been equipped. And so as we look at this program and as we move forward with this, we have to understand that this program is a part of that broader 
poverty alleviation skills training and kind of indoctrination of our students and our school leavers into the world of work. And as we do this, and as we build this future for all and have all our young people be a part of this, I have to thank some people, obviously, I don't know where he went, but Minister Morgan, who was very instrumental in thinking through this LIFT program. It's nice when you come in and there's a program already in train and you just have to tidy up the loose ends. And so I thank him. He really was behind this initiative. And I want to thank Minister Williams and the Minister of Education, because this is going to be very much linked back to within the LEGS program that they have in the ministry. And they've been so supportive. Last night, I was on the phone with Minister and her PS, and we were talking about the alignment of this program. So when we talk about joined up government, it's not just words, it's real. We're all working together to ensure that the programs that we have actually reach and get the, the kind of outcomes that we want. And so I thank Minister Williams and her team, and I see the PS here too, and I want to thank them for their support. And of course, last but not least, I want to thank the HEART team and the MOE team who are going to be driving this initiative. I have every confidence that it's going to be done well, MD. I know it will be, and it is going to, when we do it well, it's going to lead to the benefit of the entire Jamaica. And I welcome the questions later, but I'm going to hand over to our esteemed Minister of Education. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Minister um, Dana Dixon. Um, let me acknowledge the Honorable Robert Nesta Morgan, Minister with Responsibility for Information in the Office of the Prime Minister, Senator Dr. the Honorable Dana Morris Dixon, Minister with our portfolio with responsibility for digital transformation and skills. Dr. Maureen Dwyer, Permanent Secretary assigned, Minister, Ministry of Education and Youth. Uh, let me acknowledge as well, uh, even though she's not here physically, but I know she sent me a message to say that she's in traffic on her way here. Dr. Kassan Troop, Chief Education Officer Acting, other members of the team of the Ministry of Education and Youth. Dr. Tanisha Ingleton, Managing Director, Heart NSTA Trust and her team, members of the media, viewers online, Jamaicans all, good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's official launch of the Learning and Investment for Transformation LIFT program. This is indeed a collaborative program between the Ministry of Education and Youth and the OPM via Heart NSTA and as you heard earlier on, and I'll be echoing all the things um, that Senator Dana Dixon just said, um, that this is aimed at improving the social mobility of 500 school leavers, especially those who graduate from the Six Form Pathways program annually over a five-year period. It is also aimed at providing sustainable avenues for education, employment, and assimilation into society. Uh, again, especially with a particular focus on those who are leaving high school at the grade 13 level. It also looks to foster participants' adjustment to adulthood in a systemic way towards them becoming productive citizens, and I know that all of us as member of members of parliament know that in our respective constituencies, there are many young persons there who um, would love to take advantage of this opportunity. And um, indeed, it is here today for such a purpose. We want, well, I know, again, we have other members of the team here this morning. Dr. Ingleton in particular, she's going to be presenting the details of the program to help Jamaicans understand how it will work collaboratively with the Ministry of Education and Youth. Um, as you know, as a ministry, we have been moving to reorient our approach to education to make it more accessible, relevant, and practical. In particular, we've taken steps towards a more inclusive system, recognizing the importance of technical and vocational education training, because that is an area of great need in Jamaica and in our contemporary world. 
And so if you see us and hear us talk about TVET, it's because we're working in such close um, collaborative spirit with Heart Trust NSTA, and it, we want it to be a seamless progression between our schools and Heart. If we are to achieve the goals of Vision 2030 and the growth targets of this administration, then we must reposition education and training in such ways as to ensure that in the immediate and medium term future, there is extensive collaboration among the many moving parts of the society. I am not going to take up too much time because I know um, Dr. Ingleton has the details to present and then I am sure there will be questions and answers afterwards. And so again, we welcome wholeheartedly this initiative and look forward to working with the Office of the Prime Minister and with HART, NSTA in particular, to see to the smooth implementation of this program. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. We'll now have Dr. Ingleton's presentation, and after that, we'll take questions. This one is good. Good morning. I want to give due respect to those already mentioned. Um, we heard the protocols from our Minister of Education, the Honorable Favel Williams. So I want to give due respect to those already mentioned. Our Minister of Skills and Digital Transformation, Minister Dixon, spoke earlier about poverty alleviation. She also spoke about social inclusion, social mobility. And essentially, this is what the lift is created to do. Our aim is to make our young people Monday morning ready. Now, as the country approaches full employment, and we have the data to indicate that we're almost there, Minister, we're almost at full employment, we have to ensure that our out-of-school population is directed into the workforce with work-ready knowledge, with work-ready skills, and with work-ready attitudes. And so we are pleased to be collaborating with the Ministry of Education. Thank you so much, Minister Williams and P.S. Dwyer, for so gracefully accommodating us and working through this program with us. We are pleased to be collaborating with you for this special internship for 500 promising fifth and sixth form graduates who have not yet matriculated into further studies because we want to help them to secure places in government entities and of course with private sector entities. And so what are the major outcomes? I think we heard from our two ministers already, but I'll just quickly go through. The first outcome is to provide sustainable avenues for education. And so the lift will provide opportunities for continuous learning and skills development, ensuring that the participants have access to further education and training beyond high school to enhance their employability skills and their personal growth. And of course, we have the employment opportunities. So the program aims to create pathways for employment for the targeted school leaders, school leavers, sorry, um, to help them to secure jobs in various sectors based on their skills, but not only their skills, their interests, their experiences, and their qualifications. And then there is the social assimilation, which is so important. The lift will help participants to integrate into society, fostering a sense of belonging, a sense of social inclusion, helping them to understand cultural awareness, enhancing their communication skills, among other things. And then there's the social mobility. We will bolster their social mobility, um, helping them to understand how to assimilate even better in society, helping them to prepare for the world of work by providing them with various social mobility documents, which I will speak about a little later on. So essentially, we are preparing 2,500 school leavers across five years, equipping our ministries, departments, and agencies, and our private sector entities with young people 
who are Monday morning ready. So let's look at the process. It's a three-phase process. The first one is entry. Now, how will we do this? The recruitment process is rigorous. This will help us to understand the participants. So we're taking them through diagnostic testing. And when we do diagnostic testing, we will see their competences. We will be able to understand their particular career preferences so that we can best place them. Because we do not want to just put them into any ministry department or agency. We want to put them in a place where their interests can even become more peaked, where they can feel fulfilled in the world of work. And then there is orientation. So we take them through a rigorous orientation to raise their awareness, to help them to understand how to operate in a public sector entity, to help them to understand the requirements of a private sector organization, to enhance their employability skills. We will train them in financial literacy and digital literacy throughout that process of orientation. And then there is the engagement period, which is eight weeks. So we will take them through eight weeks skills training. And in this particular phase, we will help them to open bank accounts. We will help them to get their tax registration number. We will help them to get their national insurance scheme number. And of course, Jamaica, their driver's license. Which program offers that? So they will be taken through a program where they learn to drive. We will prepare them for their provisional driver's license exam. And during the period of placement, we will collaborate with the various ministries, departments, and agencies for them to do their actual driving test to be secured with their driver's license. So this is all about social mobility. And the exciting part, the part where they get the real experience is that year of immersion across the ministries, departments, and agencies. So they will be placed, and we said before that that diagnostic testing will help us to see where best to place them. And so all our MDAs would have received letters from the OPM indicating that the lift is coming on board and that they're expected to take some of our participants. Our MDAs have also been communicated with to indicate their area of preference. Where is it that they have the most need? Because when they do that, that will help us in our eight-week skills training as well. But importantly, this program is also about investment. And so our young people will be getting $85,000 monthly. That minister is a part of poverty alleviation. This is $85,000 monthly. $70,000 in hand, and $15,000 will be placed in their bank accounts that they will not be able to access until they complete the program. And this is important because we want to teach our young people how to save. And so they'll also get opportunities to, to mentor. There'll be opportunities to volunteer. So how do you participate? You may be listening or you may be a parent and you have your child and you want your child to be part of the lift, how do you participate? So these are the criteria, two character references, and of course that can be from a school official, a pastor, a JP, a member of parliament. You're expected to have three Caribbean secondary examination council subjects, that's CSEC subjects, and it must include math and English. And so Minister, Minister Williams, we're on board with you, ensuring that our young people have math and English. And so this program, there's a requirement there as well. You must be 17 years or older, and you're supposed to have a high school leaving certificate. You must have graduated high school within the last year, in the case of fifth form graduates, or the last two years in the case of sixth form graduates. Thank you. Thank you, I'm good. Thank you so much. And of course, you must demonstrate a financial need. This is important. Minister spoke about poverty alleviation. So we want to ensure that our most vulnerable, the individuals who need it the most, are the ones who get the opportunity to participate. 
And so we're going to be looking at some periods now for engagement. The application period will be August 10th through to the 31st. So we have a lot of time to, for you to get your documents in, for you to be speaking to your parents, speaking to other members of your community to be part of this program. Your orientation will be in September, and we are ready to move on that. The trust is prepared to go. And so once we get the applications in and we start to sort, you will hear from us. And then between September 2023 and November 2023, which is one month, we're going to be taking you through that core training, that employability skills training, the financial and digital skills training, and Minister um, in indicated earlier on that we do have international partnership as well. And it's during that time that you'll get that training in terms of resume writing, interviewing techniques, how to carry yourself, your deportment, what do you wear? How do you wear it? What do you say? How do you speak? How do you communicate in the space of work? And then what is most important, where you get the most experience, where you get to operate on the job, to meet people, and to demonstrate your skills and competencies, is that job placement period, which is one year, starting November this year, and ending in November 2024. And so we are preparing a new kind of public service with individuals, with young people who got an opportunity for internship to be Monday morning ready. Let's take a look at this brief video. the change witness the growth so you saw him when he just started out with his backpack all young and excited and anticipating what's going to happen and then within that immersion he came out just just brilliant in his nice suit and 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 his ID on on his waist you know just looking quite different and prepared and that is what we're about at the heart and SDA trust and through our collaboration with the Ministry of Education, we are preparing Jamaica, and we are going to be equipping our ministries, departments, and agencies, and industries with not only skilled labor, but with individuals with the requisite knowledge, the requisite competencies, and attitude to really make Jamaica a better place. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, <clears throat> Dr. Ingleton. I suspect that there may be questions about this program and other matters. So at this time, I will open the floor to any members of the media who wishes to ask any questions. Do we have any? Um, yes. I think we yes. have. Oh, OK. Morning. Chris Patterson, GIS. Uh, I'd just like to know how students sign up for this initiative. Um, will they only be placed in MDAs or is the private sector receptive to the program and could you speak to the overall budget of the initiative? Thank you. All right, I'll just start and then um, I'll ask the MD to continue. So in terms of signing up, we're going to be, as I told you, it has to be across every constituency in Jamaica. So what we will be doing, we want to choose eight students from every constituency because access is important. So not more from Kingston and you know so on. You know We want to actually spread it out across Jamaica. And so each constituency, we're targeting at least eight from each constituency. And so we plan to have the applications online. You hand them in through the MP's offices because that's close 
to where people are. We don't want them having to travel into Kingston to Heart. Um, and so that is the way that it will be done. In terms of placement, you asked a really good question, and there's something that we need to note in terms of access. In the letter that we sent to the MDAs, we also spoke to them taking people um, with disabilities. That's very important too, because we want everybody to feel like they're a part of this program. And so in terms of placement, it will be in ministries, departments, and agencies. We also want to work with the Ministry of Education. So in terms of their ongoing LEGS program, where we have phenomenal young people assisting in primary schools, some students would be placed there. And we also, I went to a meeting with the PSOJ, and I mentioned this program coming up, and they said, we want some which is important. Um, and so we have the private sector organization of Jamaica that will be, we'll be working through them to place some students in the private sector also. So it could be any ministry department or agency, or it could be in the private sector. What's also important though is, you know, we have to also look at geographic spread in terms of where they go, because some of them obviously they're living at home and they would want to have employment. That's fairly, close to where they are, so we'll also have to take into consideration those geographical demands. But what is imperative and really important is that you do the psychometric testing, so you figure out who are they, what are their interests, where would they best fit, and that's how the placement will be done. And I think, Dr. Ingleton, you can talk about the cost over um, the five-year period, but that remember, this is an investment, an investment in people, so it's important, and you need people, or, or people need to understand that we're truly investing in our young people and putting the money there. And I know it's, I know it's over two billion, but you may yes, have the precise yes, it, number. It, I, 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 without really, we're looking at eighty-five thousand um, dollars per month for um, five hundred school leavers um, for a year, and so. Um, certainly, um, um, mathematically, it, it is a huge investment, but it is an investment worth making. Um, we have to recognize that um, our young people need development. They need um, to, in a, in a systematic way, to be socially assimilated um, into the workplace. We have not been doing that enough, and so this particular program is geared towards that, and so this is an investment that um, we are willing to make, that we are able to make and that we know will have exceptional outcomes in the future for our public service as well as our um, private sector entities. Okay, do we have any other questions? Yes, the Gleaner. Good morning, Kimon Francis from the Gleaner. My questions are for Dr. Ingleton. Okay. Um, Hold on. Go ahead. What is the normal procurement process used by HART to select its general group personal accident insurance services? And what is the current status of arrangements of the provision of general and group personal accident insurance? You, those questions would have been emailed to the, the trust and they would have started the process of answering those questions. I am praying your indulgence to allow them to formally answer those questions in written form as they were posed initially in written form. I have not received even an acknowledgement to the email. Well, I'm, my, Twice I'm, I sent it. I do not work at heart, but I must apologize for that um, delay. The email was noted and was seen, and um, I know that they're working to answer your question. So you will get an answer. Can I get a commitment that they will get an answer at the latest tomorrow? Thank you very much, Dr. Ingleton. Is there another one? Yes. Uh, what the government's response to the opposition's um, lawsuit that they filed in the Supreme Court? Well, I will echo the sentiments of the Minister of Justice this morning. Um, the government acted within the law. The government acted constitutionally. There is no question about the legal process that the government um, put forward. What is clear to the government is that the opposition is carrying out a personal vendetta against an individual. They have filed a claim in relation to one individual when the law was changed to affect two individuals. The public needs to ask themselves, why target this person? They have not provided any evidence of impropriety. They have not provided any evidence of inappropriateness of behavior. As a matter of fact, 
everyone in the legal fraternity, or at least most of them, who have given an appraisal of the work of this individual has spoken about the transformative um, approach that this person has had to their office, the improvement in public education and communication, the significant successes that this office has had as it relates to, for example, the Klansman gang trial and several other major groundbreaking trials which have caused many criminals to now be behind bars. So we are a bit interested in hearing what the court has to say. But we, and we respect the court, but we do not believe, based on the frivolous grounds on which these, this claim was laid, that it would be successful. Thank you very much. Do we have another question? Yes, ministers, I crave your indulgence. There's a question online uh, asking, how does the LIFT program integrate with the education transformation mission? Minister? Thank you for the question. Um, as you know, the education, the Jamaica Education Transformation Program is a very ambitious program to look at all parts of education to make sure that it continues to be relevant. We have seven pillars in that program. Um, a massive pillar is technology and infrastructure, but it also stresses uh, skills development and for us to ensure that there is a strong and direct link between education and uh, further education and or the world of work. And what we are experiencing here right now in terms of this information about the LIFT program is one such strong and direct link between education and work. You heard the MD talk about um, or wanting our young people to be assimilated, wanting them to be Monday morning ready, um, wanting them to have that experience in the world of work. And so it is very much in tandem with that transformation uh, commission report and the work that is underway currently at the Ministry of Education and Youth. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I'm sorry, another quick one, Ministers. Um, Minister Morris Dixon. I believe there's clarification that is needed in terms of, yes, we start the applications tomorrow, but where, what website uh, will they be able to go to to apply? Well, well, we'll have it on the HART website, so it will be there. But it will also, you can also access it from the offices of the members of parliament. They will be getting communication today in terms of the details and it is going to be important, as I said before, uh, everybody has access irrespective of where you are. You don't have to travel for long distances in order to hand in your application. And so every MP will get their notification, will get their documentation. The HART team is ready to move on that. And um, you know everybody has until August 31st, and it's not onerous in terms of the, the requirements that are there, but it's a fantastic program, and we really do hope that a lot of our young people, even if they don't see this, I know their parents and their grandparents and their aunties watching, so encourage the young people in your community to partake in this program. And I know there will be quite a lot of demand for it. It's 500. No, um, that's our number. We will see what kind of take up we have, the demand, and over time, you know, we can also look back at um, the numbers. But this is a very important program that we're, we're doing here, and every MP will have a responsibility, and we'll harass them too, to ensure that they do send in the names of the people from their communities. Another Thank question? Thank you, Dr. Morris Dixon. Do we have another question? Good morning, everyone. So Shauna Small from the Jamaica Gleaner. I have some questions for Dr. Ingleton. Sure. Go ahead. Okay. Dr. Ingleton can tell me what is the state of backlog for persons who have completed courses at Hart but are awaiting their certificates? Can you go again, Ms. Small? What is the state of backlog for persons who have completed courses at Hart but are awaiting certificates? What is the timeline for clearing this backlog? Thank you so very much for that question. Now, 
we have been working very hard at heart in SDA Trust to ensure that individuals who are trained are certified and do collect their certificates. So we would have gone on a certification collection campaign drive that's all over our, our social media pages where individuals have been, have been told on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn that we're here, your certificates are ready, you can also collect them. At every interface that the trust has, we also have certificates there at our Ebony Park, um, um, Dembe Agricultural Showground that we had over the weekend. We had a table where individuals um, could come and collect their certificates. So if it is that there are individuals out there who have not yet received their certificates, it's easy to send a message to the trust. You can send it through our DM on our Instagram pages, on our LinkedIn pages. You can call 999-HOT and we will certainly have the certificate ready for you. We also have mobile services where we can literally take the certificate to you as well. So it's not onerous and it should not be a problem. Okay, thank you, Dr. English. Another question. Um, how are courses at Heart Trust structured to ensure that there is a balance with theory and practical and um, what is being done to ensure that courses offered at heart are up to date? Okay, thank you so much. The first question in terms of the balance between theory and practical, the trust is about skills training. So essentially it's experiential learning. So whilst there, is, there are the pieces for the theory, we do focus a lot on the experience. So we're looking at essentially a 70, 20, 10 model where 70% is on the actual experience, the on-the-job training. 20% would be the, the, core, the, the, the core theory of the, of the course. And then 10% would be that collaboration um, between you and your teammates, industry partners, that experience that you would get um, communicating with individuals within and outside the course. So we look at a 70-20-10 model. And so that experiential piece is the biggest and most important piece in our training. In terms of industry standards, getting our programs up to industry standards, we do work with industry to create all our programs. As a matter of fact, if industry does not sign off on a program, it cannot be offered. And so we have been working with World Skills International for the standards. We also um, collect data from the World Economic Forum to ensure that we have all the global standards incorporated in our training. Thank you. Thank you very much, Naomi. Do we have? Yes, we do, Minister. And, uh, do we have you will indulge us a little bit. The media who's not here is also sending in some questions. That's fine. Um, so we have one from Mr. Keys at TVJ, and Javon is asking for just a clarification on the role of the private sector in Lyft, and also is there already an assessment of the areas which have the greatest need for skilled workers? All right, in terms of the role of the private sector, it's really through the PSOJ and its members, we will be allocating some of our students to work in private sector entities. And so their role is identifying their partner companies or their member companies that would be willing to take these students um, into their organization and to train them. It is very important we're working on an MOU um, to work through the details of that and it's very important because remember throughout this program we want to continuously have interactions with the students. It's not that we're going to just put them in an entity whether it's a government entity or a private sector entity and leave them alone. It's very important that we track how they're doing, that we have constant interaction with them and also that we have continuous training. Um, some of it may be online um, throughout the program and so it's not just you know you get all of this nice professionalism stuff up front and then we leave you. No, that's not the kind of program. We are going to be there. The heart team is going to be there and interacting quite a bit. So it is for the members of the private sector who have indicated an interest in having these students in their organizations that will be there, will be a part of the program. Thank you, Minister. I have one from online, one of our viewers, asking uh, Dr. Ingleton now, uh, what's been the take up of courses since the announcement uh, of the removal of fees for associate degrees? For associate degrees? Okay, so we, we are all the way up to level four, which is up to the level of an associate degree. Um, so I, I can tell you definitively that to date, we are 19% above enrollment in comparison to last year. So that is excellent. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. I think members of the public are very interested in that aspect as well in terms of enrolling for the associate degrees and level four especially. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dixon, Dr. Ingleton. Um, do we have any further questions from members of the media? Very happy nobody's asking me any questions this morning. I get a well-needed break. <laughs> Good morning. Shalom is Michael from Nationwide News. Welcome, Shalom. How does the government plan to prevent the politicization of the program, given that MPs are to submit the names? Well, um, the, and, I, and I will take this one, Dr. Dixon. The fact that an MP is going to make recommendations doesn't mean that the MP will give approval. There's a very transparent process that is being engaged by the Heart Trust NTA. Professionals at Heart Trust NTA who are not politically affiliated will make objective assessments um, of the candidates. Um, it will not only include the MPs, but it will also include, for example, the principals of the institutions that the student is coming from, um, reputable members of the community, such as pastors, such as JPs, and so on. So the reason you use the MP's office is the network that it gives to Heart Trust NTA. So Heart Trust is not in every constituency. And there's also a cost for, let's say, rural persons who may want to travel from all the way in Frankfield to go to Maypen to sign up. They may not have proper internet access or they may need help with signing up. So using the MP's office is actually a plus as it gives greater access to persons in, in particular communities who may not have the access. I, we don't want to see it in a negative way, but see it as an opportunity to, for hard to partner with duly elected political representatives to give young people access. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I, oh, OK, sure. Good morning again. Another question for Dr. Ingleton. Uh, Dr. Ingleton, what is the status of the three senior management persons, um, Novlet, Denton, Prince, Sonia Ingleton, and Anika Clark, an who were sent on leave? Um, we wouldn't be able to comment because there's a process that is taking place currently in relation to those individuals, and it would be challenging to comment without possibly um, speaking inappropriately about an investigation. So, so they're still on leave? There's, there is still a, a process of investigation taking place. Um, please do not, uh, do not cause us to comment on it as that might impact on the processes. The industrial but, relations climate in Jamaica is very interesting, you know. The, the simplest of comment that we make here about somebody's job reputation or allegations can but, be used at the IDT to say that we have compromised their rights. So we're very guarded when it comes to these very sensitive matters. I understand, but yes. I just wanted to confirm if they're still on leave. They're still on leave? Yes, they are. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Minister, we have questions from TikTok. Uh, we see the target is fifth and sixth form students, but is there an age limit for the lift program? It's 17 years. 17 years, yes. all right. 17 years and older. 17 years and above. 17. So if you understand, students need to graduate from fifth form at about what? 15, 16, they're about? 16, they're about. Right. But, but you're supposed, we want you to go to sixth form. But this program is specifically geared to a very small subset of young people who, are, who do not necessarily want to go to a particular um, sixth form or a tertiary yet but are seeking some um, experience and, some, and may not even have the resources as well. So the program is not only going to provide them with the experience, but it will give them a little. It, it's, I actually have to speak about it a little because I remember when the Prime Minister announced it. You're going to get a driver's license. You're going to get possibly a passport. You're going to be taught um, various corporate skills. You're going to get an NIS. You're going to get a TRN. You're going to get a bank account. You could call it the future employee starter pack, <laughs> right? Because what you're creating is a generation of new Jamaican workers who are 
essentially the government is holding their hands through the process to ensure that they turn out to be very successful. Um, I suspect, Dr. Dixon, that this is an initial idea. The Prime Minister says he wants every young person in Jamaica to be engaged in some um, vocational or educational. We have the Pathways program where almost 20,000 young people are, 24,000 young people are engaged. We have the, um, the JDF program that is taking place, which over two, right, the Service Corps program, which over, I think about 3,000 young people have been engaged since that started. We have the whole program, which is, we're, we're trying to reinvigorate the whole program to engage more young people. We heard the stories about young people who benefited from heart before. So this initiative is essentially a part of the Prime Minister and the government's thrust to capture every single young, peop young person um, so that we can take them off the streets, we can take them out of the homes, we can engage them in something productive. That's it. I want to thank, oh, why, why, why am I afraid of this question? <laughs> They never really know. They said never allow the last question in the first conference. Oh, no, 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 no. Just checking if the EOJ has submitted a budget for any election. <laughs> My point exactly. <laughs> I would have to ask the EOJ, but I'm unaware. Um, the Prime Minister was very clear at, at the, I don't know if you were there, very clear that the government will fulfill its constitutional duties. And he said no more, and I will say no more on that. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It was a really good morning. Um, I want to thank um, Dr. Maureen Dwyer. Welcome. I'm sorry you weren't welcomed appropriately. Acting Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Education and Youth, Dr. Tanisha Ingleton, who is the head of the Heart Trust NSTA. Um, we have our two lovely ministers, Mr. Favor Williams from the Ministry of Education and Youth, and Dr. Dana Morris Dixon, who is minister here without portfolio. I also want to thank our friends from Hartra Center, the Ministry of Education, really appreciate your attendance here this morning, as well as members of the media, various other support staff, persons from GIS, um, our friends from the Ministry of Education as well, and especially you listening to us outside. Please take an opportunity to take advantage of these initiatives. Um, Heart is now free. Um, we are now providing employment to young people, more than we have ever done before. Do not let the train miss you. Thank you very much for another post-cabinet press briefing. See you next week, Wednesday at 8 a.m. sharp.